With me is the founder of WikiLeaks. He's just published When Google Met WikiLeaks. Julian, thanks for inviting us into the Ecuadorian embassy. How did it come about that you could trust Google executives, one of the most powerful companies on earth, coming to meet you while you were under virtual house arrest? Well, I'm not sure that I trusted them any more than they trusted me, but it was a, a very interesting meeting between the uh, most senior executive of Google, uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, now the chairman uh, of Google, uh, and myself during the middle uh, of the Arab Spring uh, with a, a secret meeting, and three other people also brought uh, by Google to that meeting. What did you think they were there for? Well, nominally they were there uh, in order to write a book on uh, geopolitics and uh, how the world would unf uh, unfurl, unfurl uh, and to conduct an interview with me. Um, and I thought that probably was you know, most of the reason why they're also maybe to speak to Google staff to try and make them look a bit less conservative and, and to get uh, support of, of their engineers and uh, to try and get more strategic vision for how they wanted to deploy Google over the world and what were upcoming developments that I might know about that they might not. But it turned out things were rather different. At that time, before Snowden, before other elements from WikiLeaks, we didn't really know that the Don't Be Evil company was so entwined with uh, elements of the US security state. And I know in this transcript, which makes up this book, it's a point you want to make. Eric Schmidt, uh, his father worked in the Nixon administration, and he just... Uh, written a book called Empire of the Mind, which you had read, or no? That well, I hadn't, hadn't at that stage. He, he had written an essay uh, together with Jared Cohen, the, uh, immediately, uh, no, he, he was then still uh, Hillary's uh, um, advisor, uh, called Empire of the Mind. And that was right before the Arab Spring. And so uh, as a result, um, there was a lot of interest in their sort of vision uh, for what all that meant. And they went on to write a subsequent book, which is Google's vision, geopolitical vision uh, for the world. And that got endorsements as well from Tony Blair and Henry Kissinger? That got endorsements from Tony Blair, uh, Henry Kissinger, Ma Madeleine Albright, um, a, a cast of uh, warmongers or um, actual uh, war criminals, uh, pre-publication, all set up pre-publication. And, and Henry Kissinger uh, is in fact one of the central people uh, in that book. But you know, it, it's fine for people uh, to write books. The, the question uh, to me became, why was that book written? It's a very, very strange book. Um, and you, you actually met Jared Cohen. He was one of the people that came to meet you. And this is a man, and we must say that this interview is being conducted just days after the US Congress has authorized military aid to so-called moderate Islamists in Syria. There are airstrikes in Iraq. Uh, tell me about this, Jared Cohen. So Jared Cohen was the previous advisor for Hillary. He jumped from Hillary uh, to work to being uh, the head of uh, Google Ideas. And Google Ideas is an in-house State Department that Google runs. Uh, its functions are essentially the same as the US State Department to make alliances with, ver with various people, uh, to bring together uh, activists and uh, security generals and so on, bring them together under Google Ambit. Um, and uh, create various forms of networking and uh, even in some cases uh, actively intervene with different governments to try and destabilize them. Now I've read the book and listened to the audio recording. It's quite friendly, but in Empire of the Mind there are clear uh, sentences in here, things like greater transparency in all things is a dangerous model. Yeah, the, the position being pushed forward by Google at its most senior executive level to Washington uh, is that it is the state uh, who should determine what is published and what is, not is pub what is not published. There should be a state body that oversees whistleblowing organizations and they have to go through that state body uh, before they can uh, release material. And uh, it's not just Jared Cohen. Uh, Jared Cohen's uh, past and provenance, he used, he used to work with a woman called Anne-Marie Slaughter who's been in a lot of TV studios in America, head of the New American Foundation and uh, she's saying we should, uh, we, Britain usually involved as well in covert funding in Ukraine. That's right. Uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter uh, 
Uh, it, you know, there's a, a quite a very interesting network. Let me pull back a bit because we'll get it will get quite confusing sure. if we go into all the details. But Google, at that executive level, has a revolving door with the State Department, and it is trying to become America's geopolitical visionary because it is a company that is enmeshed into the world, uh, into every single country. Uh, billions of people um, using Google services, Google co collecting all that information from all those people, their emails, their geographic locations, if they use Android powered phones, uh, and so on. And then the National Security Agency piggybacking on the top of Google and pulling information out of Google. So Google has uh, a lot of room to argue that it is uh, the edge of the way the world is developing economically and in terms of information and in terms of geopolitics because it has to deal with all these countries. Uh, so the empire of the mind and the subsequent Google book um, is a calling to Washington, not to the general public because it's not really a book that's readable by the general public, but a calling to Washington. And that's why those uh, figures such as Henry Kissinger and Tony Blair and Madeleine Albright are there giving pre-publication endorsements, that's my interpretation. When you say six billion retinas see that Google homepage every day, they were advertising a John Kerry speech when America and of course Britain wanted, uh, the governments wanted to uh, get their people to endorse the bombing of Damascus. Right, so Google has a lot of advertising power. <coughs> its homepage, uh, the most people see that per day more than anything else. Billions of people um, see uh, various Google pages, whether they're from YouTube or, or the main search page or on the Android phone. So that gives Google intense ability not only to collect information about what people are doing, but also to project um, what it wants uh, to those people. There has been a perception previously that Google, well, people just pay for ads and then Google displays those ads and it doesn't actively intervene in terms of its ability to influence. That is not true. In fact, during the most intense moment um, of the dis debate in US uh, Congress, uh, whether Syria was to be bombed or not bombed, Google, on its homepage, uh, put up a link uh, in red, highlighted, to point directly to the Kerry speech. Well, I mean, uh, that's, that's one uh, shocking piece of information. Uh, you did a couple of mainstream uh, interviews about this book, Google, very quick to say, and perhaps uphold their countercultural public relations image and say, at no point do we have this connection, and we certainly don't give all the data you just said uh, to the uh, well, National right, you have to, Agency. You have, the statement is written, it seems, by lawyers, and you have to be careful. Uh, they didn't actually say that. What they said is they don't give direct access to their servers to the National Security Agency. But that's not how the prison system works. How the prison system works is Google maintains a server uh, and the FBI is involved uh, at a sort of formal level uh, in maintaining those interception servers and then the National Security Agency is able to access those. So it's, um, but, in, but in practice as we've seen, uh, it's well documented in the Snowden documents, uh, the National Security Agency uh, can search uh, most, Google, most of Google's data for what it wants and does. How do you think Britain fits in with uh, these sorts of policies and how Google works? Are there top level connections between Google and our government? Well, the, uh, there's been reported from the Snowden material that, um, uh, that Google's internal network uh, has also been uh, mass intercepted by the National Security Agency. So a num number of things are going on here. Um, you, ha you have Google as an institution, go it is now the, the second largest company by market capitalization, $400 billion uh, in the US, and it's growing uh, ever faster and penetrating other countries. Even countries like China, <coughs> which are perceived to be more or less free from Google because they've excluded Google really from the search market there and they have Badu. But all these smartphones mean that Google, in fact, is mm, pulling lots of data out of China. Then you have Google's uh, relationship, which is a document in the book, with the National Security Agency and the defense sector in the US. And that goes way back, uh, in fact, to the very first paper that initiated Google was funded in part by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Since 2002, uh, Google has been involved in formal contracts with the uh, National Security Agency uh, of the United States. Uh, and then there is um, um, 
the National Security Agency uh, intercepting uh, Google's internal communications and communications that go to Google. So we, what we have here is a mixture of voluntary interaction um, uh, at a sort of contract official level, um, social interaction at the level of senior executives of Google, um, and then we have uh, coerced interaction uh, where the just the fact that Google is collecting all this material, uh, and that is part of its business model, to collect as much information about people and how they behave, uh, to generate profiles of them, uh, to make them as predictable as possible for advertising, that can then be intercepted. Even if the voluntary aspect of Google withdraws, uh, even if uh, the social aspect in terms of the network that Eric Schmidt uh, uh, is embedded in withdraws, or the, the in-house mini State Department they have Google Ideas withdraws. Uh, the very fact that Google's business model is to collect as much information about people as possible, to make them as predictable as possible, means that the National Security Agency is just going to piggyback on top of that. So what about all the breathless news we get about Google Glass? We shouldn't be as, uh, it shouldn't be seen as so benign. Well, I mean, Google Glass is, um, you know, possibly a, a a realization of um, some Orwellian horror in the sense that um, this places Google between your eyes and the world. So not only is Google uh, collecting your email if you use Gmail, if you use Android phone, uh, not only is it collecting what you're thinking about when you're searching, your location information uh, if you use Android phone, um, what interests you have on YouTube and so on, uh, but we're able to collect directly um, the images uh, that you are pulling through. I use an Android phone, how much? Well, 80%, 80 percent of phones now sold, the smartphones, are Android, 80%, and that, that figure is increasing. So uh, I do want you to mention the Dr. Strangelove moment when you're uh, trying to uh, get hold of Hillary Clinton, widely seen as the next Democratic presidential contender. All right, so what happens? Eric Schmidt, <coughs> you know, these Google senior executives come to see me, Eric Schmidt and three other people. Um, I don't think too much about the three other people at the time, and we have this interesting conversation which is, which is documented in the book. Um, and then a little bit later, um, I need to speak uh, to the most senior person in the State Department. Hillary is the most senior person. And so we try to arrange that call, and um, for people who are maybe not familiar with these things, you know, if you get your PA to try and do some, arrange something with someone else's PA in some big departments, actually you can get up pretty high pretty quick. Um, and there was this Dr. Strangelove moment where uh, the State Department is saying, who wants to talk to Hillary, Julian Assange? Are you, I mean, come on, is it really Julian Assange? How can we prove that it's Julian? How can you prove it's Julian Assange, et cetera, et cetera. And so we start progressing up the levels. Um, and then uh, we get a statement that there'll be a callback, uh, which is not uh, unsurprising, you know, to check, etc. And, and we do get um, communications back, uh, but we get them through a back channel. And one of my other staff members who had arranged the Schmidt visit, the, the visit by Google, he got the call. And he got the call. Even though he called he, the State Department. Not he Google. got the call from Eric Schmidt's then-girlfriend, uh, Lisa Shields, who doesn't work nominally for the State Department. She's the Chief of Communications of the Council of Foreign Relations. So the call came in, Julian wants to talk to, to Hillary. Okay, well, we need to make a back channel in the State Department. Who do we know? Da -da. Oh, that's right. Uh, you know, Lisa Shields was just out there because she, you know, we were told all about it. So get Lisa to, to be the back channel. So there we have a, a circumstance where um, the senior executive of Google was literally in bed with the State Department. But Julian, ever the publisher, even with a tag around your ankle, you ask Eric Schmidt, one of the most powerful uh, corporation leaders in the world, whether he'll leak something to WikiLeaks. That's right. Uh, we ask that Eric Schmidt provide us with the secret Patriot Act requests uh, that have been served on Google. Um, for, for 
to coerce Google to give information to the US intelligence. How did you even know that they existed? Because this is before Snowden. That's right, that's right. But I have been studying the National Security Agency for about 20 years, so um, we knew that this sort of thing was going on uh, even before the Snowden revelations. The Snowden revelations were important because they uh, gave more detail. Uh, but um, anyway, so he became very nervous and said that he couldn't uh, do that because that would be illegal. Uh, but um, I didn't realize at the time that the amount of, I thought the, the Google would be acting because it had been coerced um, rather than there was um, an element of voluntarism uh, in its associations with the, with the US military. He's since written complaining to the US government. Isn't it? Google's the issue is no, they, they shouldn't be doing it. Google's fighting against uh, the National well, Security initi Agency initially, the when the, uh, initially when the Snowden thing broke, they were playing it down. Uh, and then Google, Facebook came out with an uh, almost identical statement could have been worked on together uh, with this direct access uh, line trying to spin uh, what had been occurring. And then more Snowden documents were released documenting uh, more concretely. And then there appears to be perhaps some, even some pressure from within Google, from its lower level engineers who, who were a bit shocked to find out what was happening. And so Google has taken a more um, assertive uh, approach uh, in public uh, subsequently. But ultimately, Google is part of the defense industrial base. That's said by the head of the NSA in an uh, email to uh, Eric Schmidt. Um, it has very close associations with uh, US foreign policy circles. And that's going to continue. Um, and even if, even if we got to the stage where Google, as an organization, uh, rejected that notion that it should uh, cooperate uh, in some manner with what is going on, uh, it can simply be coerced to do so. You say in the book that when it comes to WikiLeaks itself, the opponents of WikiLeaks opportunistically they distract attention from the actual revelations. And this has been recurring in lots of WikiLeaks uh, revelations, it's always the possibility of harm. And then they kind of forget about the revelations. Just tell me a little bit about that. Look, that's something that national security journalism has been facing since at least the 1950s, possibly, uh, possibly even before. These are innocent, fair journalists, or they say this they are when they <coughs> write pieces saying you're dangerous. Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's you, know, you have to understand that when one publication publishes a, a dynamite story, other publications don't have a story. And so they try and undermine the, the story in some way. They, they have to write something, so they, they will often do that. Um, and then, unfortunately, a lot, are, you know, a lot of those people are too close uh, to the very powers that they should be trying to hold to account. If we go back uh, and, and look at what the US military, uh, Robert Gates and General McMullen, uh, said about our publications of, of, of creating hypotheticals that maybe they would cause harm, uh, our publications documented their involvement at a case-by-case -case level in the deaths of more than 20,000 people in Afghanistan and more than 108,000 people in Iraq. Those are the stakes that we were talking about. Um, not only the dissolution of two societies, but the deaths of over 100,000 people. And so when you want to distract from this, um, you just make the same accusation to the to the person that is making accusation against you. It's, it's yeah. sort of it's a kin, sort of kindergarten rhetoric. Um, your mother smells. No, no, your mother smells. I mean, it's 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 really it's really that pathetic. I mean, often it's been the most uh, in inverted commas liberal journals and magazines that seem to attack you the most. Uh, you do say something that I hadn't realized before about the Guardian newspaper. We should we should make we should make clear. Um, just to put down on record, in 2013, uh, in the trial of Chelsea Manning, uh, who was subsequently sentenced uh, to 35 years for uh, giving information to the media, and, and only for giving information to the media, there was no other allegation against them, um, that the General Carr, the person responsible for investigating whether any uh, harm was caused by our publication, US government said under oath, that they couldn't find a single person who had been harmed. Not a single person. And yet, as I said, liberal publications from time to time, I mean, the big debate seems to be, and they have these think tank debates going, 
oh, the real debate is, you know, how much should uh, WikiLeaks have released and what isn't and what is. You do say that The Guardian printed a decrypted password to all the cables. That's uh, right. Tell us, tell us about what, was it a mistake by The Guardian? I, th I think it was probably a mistake, but it's a mistake that comes in a certain context, uh, which is a context to rush. Basically, The Guardian was very concerned about what, what it had done and whether it would be aggressively criticised for what it had done in relation to us. So it had broken a contract, all three points of our contract, and there was a, there was a reputational fight on between us and The Guardian. And in that concept, it rushed to put out a book and in that book, it put the decryption password uh, for all the cables. That seems the so bizarre. Well, it's, it's, it's just completely incompetent and, and negligent. Uh, and of course, you know, they were perhaps happy to do it because they didn't mind perhaps making problems for us. Else, elsewhere, the, you know, they did things that were much more serious. For example, they secretly gave all 251,000 cables to a Mossad contact in Haaretz all 251,000. And that was the only country, uh, other, other than the New York Times, that was the only uh, country that they gave uh, all 251,000 Why would they have done that? We don't know. I mean, of course, at, at this sort of time, when there was this fight on with The Guardian, there was a film uh, that came out, uh, We Steal Secrets, I think people go through. Just tell us a little bit about how, how that uh, gave a totally false... Uh, uh, account really of uh, yeah. who you well, are, what WikiLeaks <coughs> was. I mean, there was a, a documentary funded by Universal, uh, about uh, two, two to three million uh, dollars uh, in the U.S., and it, it it was you know what is typically done in a sort of liberal sphere, which is you build them up and you knock them down, um, and so they they took that uh, uh, trajectory. But we had seen that the filmmaker probably wasn't. Um, a trustworthy person, so we didn't want to be engaged in it, so we didn't give them any interviews, and that, that was not, it's not very interesting, but they then went and came clo became close to The Guardian, so in relation to that dispute about The Guardian's incompetence in putting uh, the password in, in its uh, book, um, they took The Guardian's... It all just jumbled up together. Arguably not as incompetent all this stuff as one event you relate in here about the Ministry of Defence here in Britain's reaction to WikiLeaks when it first started the cable gate. Uh, telling British Telecom to... Oh yeah. The, the, What's the, that about? That was, that, was, yeah, that was quite funny. I mean, someone at the, the MOD saw what yeah. you were releasing. <coughs> so we released a number of classified documents in the British Ministry of Defence, very interesting uh, materials, uh, including... Uh, uh, a 2,000 page document on how to stop leaks and how the number one enemy of the British MOD was not Russian spies uh, but was in fact investigative journalists. And okay, so then afterwards as part of our due diligence to protect our sources, we filed the Freedom of Information Act request on the British Ministry of Defence to see if we could get a feeling whether there was any investigation going on and where it was leading. And we got materials out. And those materials show that the British Ministry of Defence was sort of panicked that, that this material was there and they're going, my God, there's, there's pages and pages. In fact, there's hundreds of links and they had five exclamation marks in a row. And then we've got to do something. And they're like, mm, well, OK, let's tell British Telecom, who controls the internet for the uh, Ministry of Defence, that... Um, to prevent anyone in the Ministry of Defence reading WikiLeaks. So they, the, P, the counterintelligence guys there neatly solved their problem. And their problem was that their bosses could read WikiLeaks and see Ministry of Defence material there. So they just censored WikiLeaks from their bosses. And as a result, the Ministry, it was great because we were still publishing material from the Ministry of Defence, but the heads of the Ministry of Defence couldn't see it. So Ultimate just organizational systems design yeah. disaster. Of course, it does get very serious. I mean, it's almost an aside here in this book. I'm not even sure whether we can mention the uh, intelligence security company, which you discovered was tendering for uh, millions of dollars a month uh, to target people associated with you, you and WikiLeaks. That's H.B. Gary. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll probably bleep that out. But well, uh, I think uh, the company's wound up now out of because. <laughs> I, think it's, it's I think it's gone now, that company, as a result, the, the CEO resigned and so on. But there are seriously tenders of this kind going against publications that are whistleblowing. T ten tenders, in that case, uh, for $2 million per month 
$2 million per month paid for, for by the Bank of America uh, to attack us, attack Glenn Greenwald as a, as a uh, supporter, the uh, Snowden journalist. Um, yeah, uh, and the recommendation uh, for those private intelligence companies to the Bank of America was given by the Department of Justice. Well, uh, despite all of this, here you are in the Ecuadorian embassy, Chelsea Manning, as you said, decades uh, prison sentence, the appeal coming up. You've still come out, fin WikiLeaks has still come out with the uh, Finn Fisher uh, leaks, which are part of a UK, formerly part of a UK gamma group. Just tell us just a little bit about the Finn Fisher malware that you released to the public uh, in the well, last few <coughs> days. Put it in context, 80% of the National Security Agency is run by private industry. So you think, when you think about what is the core of government, what is more government than anything else, you think it must be intelligence agencies. No, in fact, in the West, uh, the intelligence agencies are now 80% run by private industry. And so a number of different private industries have, st have started up to, you know, to sell products uh, to intelligence agencies around the world. And one of them is Gamma Group. And Gamma Group produces something called Finn Fisher. And Finn Fisher is a, a, actually a suite um, of um, cyber weapons uh, to hijack people's mobile phones, to turn on the, on the microphone on people's mobile phones, uh, to pull information out of their computers and so on. And uh, probably the most serious uh, thing that it produces is a bulk um, Trojan system that you put in the major gateway of a country or ISP and then everyone's connecting to that, the Trojan goes back down and infects their machines. Uh, and the what material that we published was the code itself to do that, the command and control center, uh, the actual uh, in infection code, uh, and then um, interactions with their clients, their various intelligence agencies saying, oh, but this thing doesn't work for me on a, on a BlackBerry version 2, et cetera. Uh, and so you get a, not only a list of clients and how much money that they've spent uh, on this software, but some of the interaction with how they are engaged in uh, targeting individuals and groups. And so populations in uh, countries which... Uh, yeah, for example, in Bahrain, um, targeting an ally human of rights. Country, an ally of, an ally of Great Britain, Britain yeah. And with a, a fifth fleet also based in... Could be used against them. Let's go to the, the normal politics of it as well. Um, you mentioned in the book uh, at one point that there were once authentic actors like uh, unions and churches and how it's all been hijacked in a sense. F you, you were depicted as, as free market statism. Yes. In this larger battle, how can what WikiLeaks does uh, contribute in, in this battle? You battle of globalization, really. You mentioned politics versus wealth transfer. Yeah, well, <coughs> we're in a position now that, you know, that there's no other game in town other than the internet. It's not, not a matter of, you know, we can't go back to the caves. Um, if we do that, we cut ourselves off to uh, influence the uh, development of society. Um, but um, what is happening now is a sort of these fluid uh, postmodern public-private networks of interaction. I gave you an example, this National Security Agency, 80% being run by private corporations. Uh, and those private corporations, though, have shareholdings across, uh, uh, across uh, jurisdictions. But the political actors that you might perceive to be working in the other direction, the NGOs, um, these m meetings like the Internet Governance Forum or the or Sweden Stockholm Internet Forum, is coming together to what it seems to create a new vision for, for a better world. Um, these are funded by the same players. Uh, so Google idea, Google and Google Ideas is funding a bunch of these and they're sort of they're captive and, and largely related to its interests. But similarly, the State Department and USAID and SID, uh, SIDA uh, in Sweden and the FCO um, are also... Bono's One Foundation, the yeah. Gates Foundation, yeah. the New America Foundation, you go on. There is hope though in this book, uh, I, I detected the political education of apolitical tech people being extraordinary. And as you said, I think before that, even at the height of the propaganda against WikiLeaks, 40% of the US population with 900,000 people in America having security well, we, we, have a, we have an update on that statistic now. Um, the ACLU, in fact, ran a, um, a survey 
so that we have majority support, even in the United States, uh, for people under the age of 40. Majority support. So despite the media propaganda, um, there's still majority support. So, so people can feel when the media is trying to push them. Uh, it's still, it's still media propaganda. Still Maybe not in Scotland. Well, but I mean, look, we, in Scotland, there was 45% uh, support of independence. That was up 15% compared to when the camp, uh, compared to a year ago when the campaign started. So, okay, they, they pulled out all stops. You saw uh, the Swedish foreign minister trying to intervene in that campaign against uh, Scottish independence, and uh, Clinton, both Clintons came out against it, and Barack Obama came out against it. The Australian um, prime minister. I mean, Australia, this is a nation that got independence from uh, the United Kingdom a hundred years ago, and it's tr going there trying to deny the Scots. First to one to bomb Iraq again, too, I think. But you, this security clearance issue, I suppose the most terrifying statistic in your book as regards the authorities, are you implying, therefore, that with hundreds of thousands of people who have the kind of security clearance that Edward Snowden has? There are now six million people in the United States with security clearances, six million. Uh, that is more population in Norway or New Zealand uh, or Scotland. Uh, it is, in effect, a state within a state. And why is it a state within a state? Because people who have security clearances have, have extra laws uh, that they're meant to obey and their flow of information about how the state works, what rules and regulations and so on that exist within that state is kept within that state because they're classified. That's an extremely alarming phenomenon. But uh, all it takes is one of them to write to you. If we go back to, if we go back to, to um, 2010, so just back to 2010, there was 2.5 million. So there's been more than a doubling of the size of the national security state within the US uh, in just, a few, just, a, just four or five years. But as a publisher, it's good news for you. It's good, it's good news for us in the sense that, yeah, the, the more people, I mean, if you think about it, six million people having security clearances, more than 1.5 million having top secret security One clearances. must doubt, just one of them must doubt about US foreign policy at the moment. Exactly, exactly. Julian Assange, thank you. You're welcome, Afshin.